sure is nice uh, seeing enough kids to be able to do that, and it's a blessing. That I thank the Lord for it. I, I taught kids for 20 years at my home church I got saved in, and it's definitely something that's on my heart. You've got you to gotta give them a foundation while they're young. Listen, if you don't give them a foundation, this world will give them a foundation. I promise you that, and it'll be the wrong one. John chapter number 18 this morning, we're going to start down around verse number 28. You know the Lord Jesus Christ has already been praying in the garden. He's already been taken here in John chapter number 18, and he's standing before Pilate. Very interesting conversation he has here with Pilate. There's a lot of people who wouldn't want to be in the Bible, but I certainly wouldn't have wanted to have been Pilate. I wouldn't have wanted to have been Judas. But you read this story about Pilate, something kind of jumped out to me that isn't as obvious at first, but let's read this. We'll start at verse number 28. He says, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas, Caiaphas is the high priest, unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, uh, but they, that they might eat the Passover. And Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring you against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would have not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. And the Jews said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. You know what their problem was? They wanted to kill him. Murder was in their heart. This man hasn't done anything. Listen, if he, they did anything, he did anything contrary to their law, their law would allow death. But he didn't do anything worthy of death. <laughs> they knew it. Look at this. Verse number 32. That the saying might of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. And Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus and said unto him, Now watch the question. We're going to come back here. Art thou the king of the Jews? <laughs> oh no. He's a far greater king than that. And Pilate don't even realize it. Watch the conversation. Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest, uh, sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews." But now is my kingdom not a, uh, from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou then a king? See the issue? He's the king of the Jews. He keeps pressing this issue. He talks about a kingdom in verse number 36. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had, listen, a lot of college professors are still asking that. Yeah. He had truth manifest in the flesh standing right before him and didn't even recognize it. And a lot of these college professors have the evidence right before their eyes and they reject the fact that God has already shown it to them. Right. Look what he says here. Verse 38 again, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said unto them, I find no fault in him at all. You know, Pilate here is one of many that professed that Jesus didn't do anything. That, that centurion of the cross, you know what he said? Surely this was the son, truly this was the son of God. Listen, Pilate's own wife testified she had a dream that this man was innocent. Mm -hmm. Judas himself 
testified that he didn't do anything. He said, I betrayed the innocent blood. Verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. And Pilate therefore heard that, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Did I skip down? I skipped down, didn't I? Let me finish reading. I'm sorry. That's where I want to be, but let me finish reading where we're at. Verse 39. We, you have a custom I, that I should release unto you a, 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 a Passover. We therefore I release unto you the king of the Jews. And they cried, uh, cried they all again saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Verse number 1 in chapter 19. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Why? Why did he scourge him? What fault did he have? Up to this point, what fault did he have to be beat like that? The Bible says, you know why he had to be scourged? Because Isaiah chapter number 53 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. For our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace upon him by his stripes were healed. You know why? By his stripes were healed. Do you know why this had to take place? It was a fulfillment of prophecy. But he's innocent. And the soldiers patted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Platted it. And they put a robe of purple. And said, Hail, king of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto him, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Isn't that something? He, God, made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? And multitudes of, of folks in the Bible testified he was innocent. You find no fault in him. Why didn't you let him go, Pilate? I'll tell you one thing you're going to learn if you stay here long enough. And I'm going to say it again. God always keeps his word. Amen. Do you know why Pilate didn't let him go? Because the scriptures had to be fulfilled. Amen. And they weren't yet. Yeah. Look at this. Verse number 6. And the chief priests therefore and officers saw him. They cried out saying crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them. Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Chapter number 18, verse number 38, I find no fault in him. Chapter 19, verse number 4, that ye may know I find no fault in him. Verse number 6, for I find no fault in him. Now, this thing ain't going to go where you think it's going to go. But I want to emphasize this. Jesus is a king. But not like any other king. That's right. He's not like the other kings. He's a faultless king. Verse number 7. The Jews answered him. We have, we have a law and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Then Pilate, when Pilate therefore heard these, this, that saying he was more afraid. And went again to the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus. Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. <laughs> Christian, you don't have to answer everybody. You don't. Sometimes you just got to let the obvious sink in a little bit with people. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Think about who he's talking to. He's talking to God manifest in the flesh. 
I have power to crucify thee. I like it because Jesus don't let him get away with this one. Watch what he says here. Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Again, God keeps his word. The Bible said we esteem him stricken, smitten of God in Isaiah 53. God had a purpose. This purpose in Jesus Christ was a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. You know what makes Jesus different than Buddha, Allah, Muhammad, all of them? Jesus is sinless. Jesus offered himself the perfect sacrifice. All the other gods in the world want you to offer something. Every single other person in the world, every king of every other nation in the world wants you to do something. You know what Jesus did? He did something for you. He's a king who gave himself for you. Amen. He's not just a king. He is the king. Amen. The king. What a wonderful God. He's not like the rest. You know why we love him? The Bible says because he first loved us. If he didn't extend that to you to begin with, you wouldn't have loved him. He reached out the olive branch to you first. Even when you were dead in trespasses and sin, he still loves you. My favorite verse is found in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were sinners in sin, living wicked, living wayward, and he still loved us. He still died for us, knowing who he was dying for. Look at this again, verse 11. Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. You know, it says Pilate from, from henceforth Pilate sought to release him. But you know what? He gave in. Let me tell you something Pilate's going to realize one day. Well, he already does. <laughs> Truthfully, he's already realized it. He already knows. This king is the king of kings and lord of lords. Church, I want to tell you this this morning. Devil's very good at something. He's very good. He's very good at getting your eyes off of what's important. He'll offer you anything, any kind of counterfeit to get you distracted. Anything to get your eyes and heart off the King of Kings. Isn't it amazing? The devil will distract us to get our focus off of him. But what I want to show you this morning, this king is not like the rest. Some of you are wrestling in your life. You're wrestling with an evil in your life. You're wrestling with a devil who's most certainly real. And if you don't know he's real by now, something's wrong with you. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what he does according to John chapter number 10. He's an enemy that is a formidable foe without power from this king right here. If you don't have this king... As king of your life, see in the scriptures we can say greater is he that is in us than he's in the world. If you're here and you're lost, you can't say that. You don't have power. You know what he told the uh, Lord Jesus Christ told Pilate? Thou canst have no power against me at all except it would be given thee. That tells me the ultimate power is with God Almighty and God manifest in the flesh was that power. Think about it. Here's a worldly man saying, hey, don't you know I have power to, 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 to take your life, to crucify you? Jesus realizes, he already knew, and reminds him, you don't have any power at all. You don't have any. Let me tell you something about Satan. We're going to talk about this just for a minute. 
Satan has got some of you duped. And some of you believe that his power is stronger than the power that God gives. And you would be wrong. And some of you enjoy his delicacies. Some of you enjoy eating at his table, that devil's table. And it has not helped you at all to this point. And you need to get your heart right with God and focus on the power that can change your life. A power that you can look back 27 years and say, that's what I was and this is what I am. God has brought me a long way. But you know what? Some of you like toying with him. Some of you think that he's your friend. And I'm going to tell you, you'd be wrong about that. We're going to, we're going to read a few passages here this morning. You better understand this. One day, one day, you're going to find out that this foe is not very powerful in light of an almighty God. He seems so powerful now because of all the havoc he wreaks. But one day, and he knows he's got a limited time. I want you to see this first of all. Christ is not a king. Christ is the king. First, uh, First Timothy chapter number six. The difference between him, he's above all. I want you to see this. First Timothy chapter number six. We'll turn to some passages. I hope you don't mind turning to some passages. So what we need to do this morning. And if I need to slow down, if you just flag me, don't be embarrassed, just flag me. I'll slow down because I want you to stay with us. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Look at verse number 12. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. And before Jesus Christ, look at this. Guess who's brought up right here? (laughs) Oh. Who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good uh, confession that thou keep this command. Why why did he bring up Pilate here? (laughs) Watch what's fixing to be said. It's something Pilate didn't get, but Jesus didn't hesitate to let him know it. That thou keep his commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his time shall show. Now what? This is what Pilate didn't get. Do you see the semicolon at verse number 13? When you come to that semicolon, he's explaining what he just said. This is what Pilate didn't get. Which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and what? What's the word? Only potentate The King of kings and Lord of lords. That book says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess so that every one of us will give account of ourselves to God. Kings will come before this king and bow and give an account. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not a king. He's the king. He's the only potentate. Go tell that to these masons. I'm not into this mason stuff. I, I let the cat out of the bag. I'll just go ahead. They, they set up a man and they say, here's our potentate. Our worshipful master. There's only one potentate according to the scriptures. One potentate. One ruler. One supreme person. That's it. There's no worshipful master outside the Lord Jesus Christ. That's so, such blasphemy, y'all. He's the only potentate. Look at this. All the way at the end. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Look what it says here in Revelation 19. Now Pilate wasn't just talking to any old king here. He made light of it. He's the king of the Jews. No, you missed it, buddy. You missed it. 
Look at this. Revelation 19. Look at verse number 11. Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven open up. And behold a white horse. He that sat upon him was faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth make a judge and make war. His eyes were as a flaming fire. The Bible says in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, 8, He's going to come back with flaming fire, taking yeah. vengeance on them that know not God. His eyes were a flaming fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So we know who this is. Is there any doubt? Now listen, this ain't the same white horse rider we read earlier in Revelation. The white horse rider in, early in Revelation is the Antichrist. You can read the context and you know it is. It ain't the same person. Verse number 14. The armies which are uh, in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. And he ruled them with a rod of iron, and he treaded the winepress of the fierceness uh, uh, and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. What's that name? King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen, don't you let the devil trick you into thinking that he's in control. The devil is not in control. The Almighty is in control. And this thing is working out just like he said it would. I'm telling you, you live in a day where prophecy is unfolding before our eyes daily. Now listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. Some of you like prophecy. I like prophecy. I talk, I talk to Ms. Althea about this. People get so caught up with prophecy, don't they? I think you should study it out. But I got family members that can tell you what they think prophecy is. And let me tell you something about prophecy. Them disciples, Jesus was giving them prophecy that he would go to the cross and die. It wasn't until after the resurrection that they said, then understood whereof he spake. There's some things you and I think we understand. Cappy approached me about eagles, eagles and some of this other stuff. Listen, I don't know everything. I don't know if that represents our nation. I don't know if it represents, I don't know all that. Some of the things the disciples thought they knew, they didn't know. But I was talking with, with Miss Althea. I said, listen, a lot of people know prophecy. They know the love of many shall wax cold. They know that's in uh, uh, Matthew 24. They know that deception is going to be high. They'll quote it to you. Uh, they know, Daniel, that, that knowledge would be increased in the last days, that travel would be increased. They would go to and fro. They know that, Daniel chapter 12. They'll quote you the chapter and the verse. I got some family members that will quote you chapter and verse. They know more about prophecy, Michael. They know more about the things of prophecy in the book than they know about a relationship with a holy, righteous God who sent His Son to die for our sin. They know more about that than they know about Jesus Christ. And He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's more important than all of that. If you don't have Him and you know all of that, you're going to perish. What good is it to know all that? The Bible says in James, the devils believe and tremble. Church, let me ask you something. How is your faith any different than the devils? It says they believe and tremble. I'm going to tell you what, you can believe a lot of things about the Bible and still go to hell.
Do you know that do you know that God reminded that rich man when he was in hell they have Moses and the prophets let them hear them You know what he reminded him they had the same thing you had before you went to this place called hell and you rejected all of that and that's the only testimony I'm giving them and if they reject it they'll be right here where you're at Yeah isn't it amazing how many people have it, but they don't have a personal relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They don't know him. You know what? You know what? Listen to me. Over there in Matthew chapter 7, over there in Luke chapter 13, you know what you hear people saying? Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied and in thy name done many wonderful works? Now you think about it. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They called on the name of the Lord. Why weren't they saved? It's a heart issue. It's a sincerity issue. You know what he told them, told them people? They'd done all this religious stuff in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, I'm not interested in you being religious and you coming here out of religious duty. I'm interested in you making sure Alex preached on examine yourselves yesterday at the nursing home. You need to examine yourself. Too many people are trying to examine other people and make sure they're up to snuff and they're not staying at home and driving in their lane and looking at their own life first. You examine yourself whether you be in the faith. A horrible thing would happen if people sat here and listened to the word of God and a preacher who's pleading the best he can and perish and die and go to hell. That'd be horrible. Yeah. When you were so close and yet in the scriptures we're given illustrations. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name done many wonderful works in another passage? He's, thou hast taught us in our streets. Now think about it. The King of kings and Lord of lords says, depart from me. I never knew you. Do you know the King of kings and Lord of lords? Now listen, some of you have been searching, and I'm thankful. You would do well if you have questions and things you don't understand to ask and be very specific. The Bible says that you'll find me. The Lord says you'll find me when you search with, for me with your whole heart. Yes. If you put an effort into it and search for him, you'll find him. Yep. You know why so many don't find him? They take it lightly. Right. The next thing I want to show you, it, it's a spiritual kingdom. We miss this. Go to, go to 2 Kings chapter number 6. I'll, I'll give you time to get there. It's near the front of the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 6. I want you to see this. I, I want to say this up front, y'all, as you're making your way to 2 Kings 6. The Bible is very clear that the battle is a spiritual battle. Yeah. Up until this point, some of you have been trying to fight this thing with your flesh. My own wife reminded me this morning, and I'm glad I was already doing it. Are you praying about it? That was wisdom. I'll tell you why it was wisdom. My wife has learned that I can't win the battle, she can't win the battle by trying to force my desires and my will. But what will get the job done is for you to get on your face before a mighty God who can fight the battles that you can't. It's a spiritual battle. And listen, you better put on spiritual armor it's not flesh. You can't win with this. You're not going to win. Let's look at this. We know there's a battle here. And, uh, and Elisha, look at chat, uh, verse number 10. We'll start, just jump in about right there. The Syrians have come up against Israel. And verse number 10, they're trying to find Elisha here, trying to hunt him down. Verse number 10, and the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once nor twice. Uh, therefore the heart of the king of Syria. So the Lord was manifesting to Elisha 
where the Syrians were going to strike. And so Elisha would tell them, hey, you need to move. The Syrians fixing to strike, and they'd move, and Israel would be gone. And the king of Syria couldn't figure out, man, do I have, do I have a traitor in my midst? He didn't realize that God was telling them where to move at. Watch this. Verse number um, 11. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto him, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and great hosts that, that came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God had risen early and gone forth, behold, the host was compassed. Uh, and hosts compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You say, how so? Isn't that something? Here they are. The whole Assyrian army has circled the prophet and his servant. Servant steps out of the house and sees this massive army completely surrounding them. Comes back in all panicking to Elisha. Who's sitting there going, I ain't worried about it. We got more on our side than they got on theirs. Listen to me, young man, young lady. Listen to me. The day you realize flesh means nothing in the sight of God. Yeah, right. He can handle all of that. I'm thankful for the men of God who will say, look, you need to calm down. It's all in control. It's in God's hand. Watch what he says to this young man. Thankful for God giving him a glimpse. Verse 17 and 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that are with us are more than they that are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his, the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Listen. The real chariots of fire. Not this fake song they sing. This really happened. Let me tell you something. The day you realize that there are spiritual entities all through the world trying to influence the balance of good and evil. Daniel said that it took 21 days. 21 days for that message to get through and that individual, Michael, to stand on behalf of Israel and fight the Prince of Persia just to get a message through from God. 21 days. There are spiritual beings that are influenced and, and you need to quit looking at this thing as, as just flesh. Because that's all you're seeing. And you better start looking and seeing that there is a spirit behind the evil that is in this world. There is a spirit behind that, that family member that you always have a problem with. There is a spirit behind that co-worker you struggle with. I'm telling you, in this world, there is spirits working. And, until, and listen, Elisha had a relationship with the Lord, and he could see it. And I'm thankful for today that some of you will get your eyes open like this little servant. And I pray to God that your eyes will be open, And you recognize that it's a spiritual battle and until you start using the spiritual weapons, go to Ephesians 6, 
Until you start using them, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. Listen, uh, the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through the pulling down of stronghold. If it's not carnal, if it's not fleshy weapons, then what is it? Listen, it's amazing. I've seen more done, more done through earnest prayer than I've ever seen done through my efforts. I'm telling you, I've seen some amazing things done through prayer. And you know what we neglect the most? We neglect the things that help the most. We get in there and try to fix everything. We think we can straighten it out. We got this under control. And you know what God says? He just sits right there. All right, you go ahead. When you get done, we'll do it my way if you want to. Look at this. Verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? His might. When are you going to stop trusting in your might and start trusting in His might? Yes. Amen. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against who? You know what the Bible says on another occasion? Resist the devil and he will flee. flee from thee. Some of you need to get to resisting him. But how are you going to resist him with your flesh? That Bible tells you that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Listen, that rascal don't want you to know that God, you didn't get it yourself, but God has given you the power and the authority to withstand the wiles of the devil. Yeah. And he does not want you to know that. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Can I say that again? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against, get it, spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, there's a word here in chapter, uh, verse 13. It says, wherefore. When you get to wherefore, you need to find out what the wherefore is there for. You hear me? He just made a statement and said, you can resist the wiles of the devil. You can stand against principalities and power. Think about that. One angel killed a hundred and 85,000 Syrians in one night. One angel killed 185,000 people in the flesh. Mm -hmm. But the Word of God tells you, with the armor that God gives you, you can withstand not only that, but the wiles of the devil himself. The leader, the ringleader of them all, the Bible says you can withstand him. But you ain't going to do it with your flesh. Look at this armor. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Now you, you do well to read this. Meditate and study this. Because he just told you how you can withstand the wiles of the devil. Amen. Amen. How your, how your loins going to be girded about with the truth if you don't read it? You say, how does that help defend against the devil? Well, if I recall the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he was tempted, you know what he did to the devil? You can read of it in Matthew 4, 4. He said, the scripture saith. He quoted him scripture. And when the devil quoted him scripture back out of context, you know what Jesus did? He didn't skip a beat. He just kept right on quoting him scripture. 
It stands to reason that if the Son of God used Scripture to defeat the devil, then you're going to have to use it too. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, having the breastplate of righteousness. You know what? You need to be saved. You've got to have the breastplate of righteousness. Listen, your righteousness is not enough. Jesus' righteousness is enough. Yes. It didn't say the breastplate of self-righteousness. It says the breastplate of righteousness. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You need to be a Christian. You need to be getting the gospel out. If you're saved, you need to be getting the gospel out. You say, why? That book right there just told you that that's part of resisting the devil. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something, Christian. I'm going to tell you. Some of you, some of you could have a much more victorious life if you would start opening your mouth on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, your life will be much more victorious over the devil. You'll get stronger and stronger. It's God's growing process. You're going to have to take a stand. You're going to have to open your mouth. Look at this. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. What's the opposite of faith? Isn't it doubt? So it would stand to reason that those fiery doubts, no, dar uh, no, no doubt, <laughs> are darts of doubt. It's Satan sending doubt to you. You know how you put the doubt out? Faith. You trust God. Listen, a lot of people want the magic formula. <laughs> There's no magic formula to being saved. But I'm going to tell you this. If you don't trust God, you don't put faith in God, you're going to fail. Yeah. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. That's what the book says. Feet shod with the preparation. Let's see, we're at, look at this. Verse number 17, taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, it's the only defensive or offensive weapon there is a sword. Guess what you're going to stick the devil with? It's going to be the Word of God. Everything else is defensive. Loins girt about with truth, breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, helmet of salvation. That's all defensive. The weapon you have is a sword. The sword is the word of God. You know why some of you don't fight well? And they're all tied together. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? It's a shield of faith, but you can't even have the shield of faith without the word of God. Watch this. He says, praying always in all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with uh, perseverance and supplication for, for all saints. You know what? I give this illustration. Two places you don't have armor. Some of you know this. Two places you don't have armor. You don't have any armor from here to here. And you don't have any back here. You know why you don't have any back here? You can't turn your back on your enemy. You turn your back, you give your back to the enemy, he's got you. Mm -hmm. You're not turning back. You face him. And there's no armor here to here. Because the battle is fought just like this. If you don't get down here, you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. The way up is down. So it's a spiritual battle. Let's look at this. Our enemy is a defeated foe, but he does not want you to know this. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 2. Let me tell you something. Some of you choose to go through life 
being ignorant concerning, I'm not, I'm not saying it's in a slanderous way, just absence of knowledge. You choose going to be ignorant uh, as far as Satan's devices when the Bible says you can actually know them. Look at verse number 10. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also, for I forgave, for if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Look at verse number 11. Lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. The Bible says we can know how he works. You know how you can know? You read of Job. Let me tell you something about the devil's limit, limits. Let me just tell you a little bit. You read Job chapter number 1 and 2. You know what Satan says? You got a hedge about him. I can't get in. Yeah. You go to Revelation chapter number 20. See, the devil don't want you to know this. There's actually an angel that binds him in Revelation chapter number 20 and casts him into that pit. Yeah. Isaiah 14. Go to Isaiah 14. He has limits, y'all. He wants you to think he's limitless, but he's not like God. He wants you to think that, but he's not. He's not. He's a defeated foe. He's already lost. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. I think we're going to look back when we see him. The devil uh, likes for us to have an image that he's all powerful. He even paints himself with these horns and he's all mean and rough and tough and you know, you know, you're scared of him and... I want you to see what it says, his end. When people look on him and his end, I want you to see what it says they're going to say of him. We're going to look back and say, I wish I'd have took a better stand. That's it? That's all? That, that right there is it? And I was scared? In light of an almighty God. Yes, your flesh wants to be scared. But I'm telling you, we're going to look back through spiritual eyes and say, man, my God is way higher than that. You say, how do you know? The Bible says so. Look at this. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which disweakens weaken the nations? For thou said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation of the sides of the north. I will descend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. You know what Satan wants to paint a picture to you about? I am just as powerful as God. That's not true. That's a lie. Some of you have lived under His control for years and you could be free from the bondage that he's put you in if you would just throw in the towel. Yeah. Look at verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. That's Revelation 20. I just told you. When that angel binds him and brings him down. To the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee and say, this is what they're going to say, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? You know what they're going to look at him and go, when he's in that pit, that's the one that caused all the trouble? That right there? It said they'll narrowly look on him. What does narrowly mean? That? Now, from the eyes of flesh, he seems pretty powerful. From the eyes of flesh, we see six million Jews that were murdered by one devil-possessed man. That's what we see of the devil. But I'm telling you, go to Revelation 12. We are just about done. Revelation 12. Revelation 12. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12 I want to remind you of this verse number 9 
And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Uh, for the accuser of the brethren cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. You want to overcome the devil? Guess how you're going to have to do it. You know why some of you can't overcome him? You ain't even saved to begin with. You don't even care. You don't even care enough for your own soul to be serious about it for a little bit. And get that thing right. But if you're going to overcome him, you're going to have to be saved to begin with. And by the word of their testimony, love not their lives unto the death. Now watch this. Wherefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devils come down unto you having great wrath. Watch this limit, just like with Job. Because he knoweth he hath but a short time. Yeah. I'm telling you, that old rascal is limited. Now you would think if you knew that you only had a short time, you'd say, God, I changed my mind about this. I don't want to be like you. I repent. I want to get right. I want to make this right. I'm sorry. Not this one. Not this one. But he knows he only has a short time. Hebrews 12, I'll close right here. Church, if I can get you to focus on one thing, it's found in Hebrews 12. It's found in Hebrews 12. Listen, there is so many distractions in our day, isn't it? That Hollywood will give you plenty. I'm telling you, the devil, if he can't get you with the baseball, he'll get you with some perverted show. He'll get you with the lust of your flesh. He'll get you with the desires of, uh, of drink and drugs or whatever. You, you're happy. People say, well, I, I ain't got no problem with that, but you got one. You got a problem that you wrestle with. And if he can offer that to you, he'll keep you in bondage. But I want to show you something. If you do this, y'all, I'm telling you, your life will be so much more pleasant. I get Christians all the time that I take them to Hebrews chapter 12. Oh, did you see what happened in Russia? Oh, did you see what happened with the AI, the artificial intelligence? Oh, did you see COVID vaccine? Oh, they're trying to kill us. Oh, yeah. Oh, this and that. Oh, you get all worried about all of that. I'm going to tell you why you get all worried about the stupid things in life. I'll tell you why. Your affections are in a place they should not be. Your heart is somewhere it should not be. Yeah. Hebrews 12. Wherefore seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Look what it says in verse 2. Looking unto Fox News... Looking unto CNN. Is that what it says? Looking, listen, for the life of me. Why would any fornicating, adulterous Hollywood star or football player's opinion matter more than somebody else's? Why? I want to just say sometimes, won't you just shut up and throw the ball through the hoop? Because that's what you're good at. You ain't good at talking. Is that too crude? Would you please be quiet? <laughs> I'm just saying. What, wh why does their opinion matter? Because they made their money through a vain way of making money. Why do we focus on everything but what we should focus on? That book says, verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down. Now listen to me. Here's the king. He's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's not going anywhere. He's exalted on high. And the sooner you realize that's where he's at and he ain't going nowhere, the better off you're going to be. So you focus on him on that throne. When you start getting down, focus on him on that throne. When you start getting into sin, focus on him on that throne. When you start buying into what your friends say, focus on him on that throne. 
Don't let the devil distract you. He's very good at it. He'll give you a counterfeit. Looking unto Jesus. Who is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says, for consider Him. You're to look unto Him. You're to consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinner against Himself. Lest you be weary and faint in your minds. You know how you keep from being weary and faint? You got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Some of you here ain't saved. I can't do anything but plead with you. That ball is in your court. But I know this. He don't waste no time on his side. He paid your debt up front. It's paid. And he said it's paid. As soon as you're willing to uh, reach out the hand of faith and take it, I'll give it to you when you're ready. That's your choice. What amazing God. If you're not saved here, you need to be saved. Christian, if you're not focused on the Lord, you need to get focused on him. You need to get focused on him. Keep your heart on him this week. I'm promising you this. The devil will Try to get your mind off of him. He will. I hope this helped you today. Let's stand for prayer.